Hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel and today I wanted to talk about all the books I read in August. I've read six books in August. Um, it was a real mixed bag. Some books I really loved and some I didn't so much. Um, so let's just get into them. The first book I read in August was Our Lady of the Nile by Scholastic Mokasunga and this book was translated from the French by Melanie Mautner. The author is uh, from Rwanda and this is also set in that country about 15 years before the, the Rwandan genocide um, and it is very much set up um, against the background of uh, a country in unrest um, uh, in a country where racial tension is mounting. But the main stage of this book is a, a high school called Our, Our Lady of the Nile, which is run by uh, colonial white nuns. It is a very exclusive school. Uh, most of the students are from very well-to-do um, and powerful and important people of uh, Rwanda. So going into this book, I was hoping for um, a combination of like high school drama, um, jealousy, friendships, rivalry in a school. This um, combined with the history of a country and the political situation and what it is like growing up in a, in a country where um, there's a lot of unrest. And in a lot of ways, that is what this book is about. It um, the book starts at uh, the new school year and throughout the book you um, meet different teachers and different students and you, you follow uh, different storylines. But what disappointed me in this book is that um, none of these storylines really seem to go anywhere. Um, you would start to follow one character in this book. Um, and you know, get interested and in invested in that story, and then it would just end. You get introduced to different characters, but it it never really followed th through. There's even one point where you meet a student, um, and then she dies, and then just literally two sentences sentences later, she never gets mentioned again, and doesn't get mentioned that she's died. You know, the next part would be about something completely different. And the book sort of accumulates to this big climactic ending. But because the book was so fragmented, I, I never really got the chance to get to know these characters and get attached to them. I just didn't care in the end about what happened. I must say that I probably would have gotten more out of this book if I had known a little bit more about the situation in Rwanda. Um, I think it does uh, comment on that and um, uh, I feel like I might have missed um, uh, some bits in that. So that is totally um, uh, on me and uh, um, I think if, if you would go uh, and read this book it would be good to invest some time to learn a little bit more about the country's history um, because I do think you'll get more out of it. I did like that there was a lot of talk about colonialism, about racism in the country and that it had some uh, interesting points to say about it. Um, you know, the, also the, the legacy of the... But in the... Um, there's definitely definitely some in there's definitely some interesting uh, topics being discussed in this book um, there's um, uh, talk about racism the um, influence uh, of the Bel Belgian colonialism that I found very interesting um, but in the end I just felt it was a book with a lot of potential but um, I it felt really de detached in the end and I, I wanted a bit more of a narrative in this story. So unfortunately not my favourite, um, but still, I'm still glad I read it. 
and then I read a uh, Dutch book. This is called uh, Onder Asphalt or um, Under the Tarmac, um, written by Maarten van der Graaf. And this is a dystopian book set in the Netherlands, which immediately was something I was interested in because um, I do like dystopian uh, novels and I found it interesting that it was set in the Netherlands because usually they are set in America or either a very um, unrecognizable um, world. Uh, I read it with a, a summer book club I was part of and in this book we follow two different timelines. One is set um, in the summer of 1999. One evening all the uh, highways or motorways disappear um, and we follow uh, a bunch of different characters just before or just after that event happens. And then the second timeline is set in 2068 and we mainly follow a, um, a woman who is taking care of her elderly mother and her mother is suffering from probably some form of, some of dem dementia and uh, she's um, uh, living in a care facility. And then there's also a bit with angels which I still really don't get how it relates to any of the other plots <laughs> but I still wanted to mention it because they're there. So the biggest chunk of this book um, I enjoyed. Uh, it is very much what I like uh, in a dystopian book which is um, just sort of figuring out how it all works. You know, figuring out you know what life is like in in this uh, in this future. Uh, what are the rules uh, of society? What happened in the past, and how did we get from that moment in 1999 where all the the motorways disappeared, and how do, did we get from there to now? Figuring out how um, this relates to our world right now. Um, it, it is very much a commentary on society, um, you know, on, on politics, on, on social media. A big part of this is how a government deals with a crisis, which was very reminiscent of how, um, uh, how the world reacted to Covid. Um, you know, you think about how the, the loss of the, the motorways might signify a, a sort of loss of connectivity between people. So I was really uh, enjoying myself until about 50 pages from the end um, a big plot twist um, happens or a big reveal and it just pissed me off. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> I, um, you know, really hadn't had such a strong reaction to a reveal in a book for a long time. And I'm going to tell you what happened in a minute, so if you really don't want to know, you can just skip ahead a few minutes. I'll put something up in the screen so you know when I'm finished talking about it. So what gets revealed at the end of the book is that everything that happens in this book isn't actually happening. Um, it is about a woman who has some sort of mental illness where she um, you know, has a distorted grip on reality, also probably has multiple uh, personalities um, and I just really didn't like it. I, I don't mind if a book has a um, unreliable unreliable narrator. I also don't mind if something happens in the book that I didn't see coming. But what I don't like um, is that I could never have guessed it. There's no hints, there's no clues, there's no signs whatsoever um, that this would happen and actually in the book club one of um, uh, one of the members um, she uh, read this book for the second time so I asked her if she read the book different, differently this second time around and if she noticed any, anything that would um, point to this reveal happening in the end and she was like no 
you don't uh, uh, see any clues throughout the book. I don't have to have everything explained in the book, but don't explain it by a mental illness. Um, just, I, I just really didn't care for that uh, uh, reveal. So yeah, mostly um, this book I really enjoyed, not the ending. It is a great book for a um, book club though. We had a really fun discussion uh, on it. Um, some people love this book, um, some didn't so much or were very um, sort of in the middle in the middle about it um, but um, yeah definitely a great book to discuss even if I didn't actually enjoy it. And the next book I read was A Woman in the Polar Night by Christia Christiana Ritter and this was translated by um, Jane de Grasse from uh, the German. Uh, Christiana Ritter is a Austrian uh, writer and this is a memoir and this was first um, published in German in 1938 and in this book we follow um, uh, the writer and sh uh, her husband works in the Arctic. Uh, I'm not sure what he does there but he, he lives there and he's been living there for a couple of years and he asks uh, his wife to come and um, live with him for a year and at first she's uh, pretty excited about this. He has a little bit of a romantic view of just sitting in a cabin, reading all the books and just, you know, having a cozy time. So she um, travels there and, and she gets there and quickly learns that um, it is obviously not as romantic as it might sound um, because this is the Arctic. It is very cold. Um, you know, it is very much about survival, um, very bleak, there's no provision, there's one really funny moment when, um, uh, you know, they were talking about making bread and then her husband says, oh, oh we forgot to um, pick up uh, any, any yeast or baking powder at the shop, we'll just do it next year and we'll invent something in the meantime. And then <laughs> the author is like, what do you mean, invent baking powder? You know, we're not a chemical fact factory here. I'm so sorry, my battery died. Rookie mistake. Um, I was talking about a woman in the polar night and I believe I was just saying uh, about how uh, Christiana um, was a little bit disappointed, uh, disappointed when she first got to the Arctic. She was finding it very hard to live there. Um, but uh, as we go uh, along in the novel, you um, really see how she starts to appreciate the Arctic uh, more and more, despite uh, uh, the harsh, harsh living conditions. I love this how this was written. It was. Uh, really showing us what the landscape was like and how um, uh, unique it is to live in the Arctic. Um, one thing she talks about um, was the uh, was the sound in the Arctic, like how uh, when a place is so barren the sound travels differently. She talks about what it's like to be in a landscape that is is so barren that you know literally everything is white um, uh, you know the whole uh, the whole view there's nothing um, to take your mind off things there's just no point where you can focus your mind on there's um, uh, you know nothing in the landscape that you can uh, that you can see and um, she talks about how you know that the place tricks with your mind because it, it just literally has nothing to focus on um, so yeah, there's, there's um, things like that she talks about um, and just uh, the way she describes the landscape, the weather, but also you know, just her, her daily life, how, how she deals with um, living in such a, a harsh environment is really, really fascinating. I thought it was beautifully, beautifully written and um, yeah, I would highly recommend uh, this book. And the last book in translation I read um, in August was um, uh, Isa's Ballad by Magda Zabo and, and this was translated from the Hungarian by George Zietetes and I read this together with Karen over at uh, the Roving Reader and um, I had a lot of fun discussing this with, 
with her. At the start of this book um, we meet an, an elderly woman named Etty uh, and her husband recently passed away. She's living in a small town. She's leading a very simple life. Um, she's, she's poor and she's um, un, uh, uneducated. When her uh, husband dies away her daughter Isa um, decides to take her in um, into her own home and Isa is a woman who is very much went away from uh, life in in this small village and she moved to the big uh, to the big city to Budapest and um, yes, she became a doctor so she has a very different life um, uh, as her mother had. This um, book is very much about two people um, wanting to take care of each other in a time that is very sad for both of them but because they don't communicate with each other they seem to not understand what the other person wants um, a simple example is um, you know when the mother um, moves in with her daughter she really wants to help out and she wants to you know help with the cleaning um, uh, things like that but uh, the daughter has uh, a cleaning lady and she thinks her, her mother deserves a rest because she's been working so hard uh, all her life. She's getting older and so she, she deserves to um, you know, have someone else um, do the hard work for once. But uh, on the other hand, the mother is um, missing the hard work because that's all she's done her whole life. And um, th that is her way of um, showing appreciation. and. Um, it, also, it is also very much a part of her uh, identity um, to work hard. She takes pride in it. The mother ends up getting more and more withdrawn. Um, you know, she's sort of scared to do the wrong thing. And at the, the same time, the, the daughter, she's getting more and more annoyed with her mother because she's getting so withdrawn and, and she doesn't know what she's doing wrong. Um, so you can see this um, uh, sort of chasm building between them, which ultimately is just very, very sad because it, it feels like it could have been solved easily if they would talk to each other. It is definitely uh, a book that makes you think a lot. Uh, me and Karen talked a bit how it, it makes you think about uh, your own parents getting older. We talked a bit about how um, uh, you can take different paths in life um, and you know sort of what role um, religion can can play um, uh, in your life um, and um, religion and uh, certain rituals. And I think it is a book that I could return to again and, and again and see how my experience is different when I read it in a different life stage. Um, this is very beautifully written. It, it's really um, you know, every every sentence seems to have meaning to it. Um, uh, it is a book that's also just deeply sad. It doesn't give redemption at the end, um, which uh, seems realistic, but also just makes it all the more more poignant and and heartbreaking. I really really uh, enjoyed it, even though it was a, a hard book to read. And then I read Inferno. A Memoir of Motherhood and Madness by Catherine Cho and, um, and this is obvi obviously another memoir and um, in this we we follow the author as she is um, traveling um, from the UK t to the US with her three-month-old baby and they're traveling to introduce um, the baby to her family who lives in, uh, in the US um, and whilst um, she's there she develops a postpartum psychosis and um, stays at a psychiatric ward uh, for two weeks and this um, memoir is set up as uh, sort of diary fragments and pieces she's written whilst she was uh, on the psych psychiatric ward where you know she's sort of slowly piecing together uh, what has happened and um, trying to figure out what events in her life um, has uh, led up to this moment. She also talks a bit about her uh, life uh, at the ward and sort of other patients who are there and you know what her day-to-day -day life is but mostly these are um, 
uh, more uh, memories uh, she's talking about. Yeah, but mostly about the different elements of her life that have uh, led to this psychosis. Um, one of them being a, a very abusive relationship she was in when she was uh, um, a bit younger. Um, she talks a lot about the influence of her Korean heritage um, and uh, uh, the beliefs uh, and, and rituals there are in Korea about motherhood, about happiness and how that uh, clashes with the Western world she lives in. Um, there's the relationship her husband has with his parents and you know how that is a complicated re relationship and how she sort of has to figure uh, out how the dynamics work in that relationship. She talks about um, her pregnancy and um, uh, her, her delivery of her, her son and how um, that is something that uh, she really struggled with because she felt a lot like she lost her identity and she had to figure out a new identity as a mother. And then sort of together with, um, you know, being tired of you know taking care of a uh, three month old baby and and being tired from from traveling and seeing so many family members um, uh, and then she also uh, gets sick with mastitis and she develops a fever and this all accumulates um, in her literally losing her mind um, she um, at her worst point believes uh, that her baby is the devil and she sees um, you know, when she looks at her baby, she, she sees devil, devil's eyes um, uh, in her baby's eyes. That is really the point when she real, realizes something is wrong. And uh, she makes clear to her husband that, that um, she needs to get away. And, you know, from that point it just escalates. And um, uh, her, her husband has her uh, committed to um, a psychiatric ward where um, she's treated and, you know, after two weeks um, she is better enough to go home um, but um, yeah this was a very very vulnerable book very open very honest um, um, you know it, it was raw and it was it was very hard to read you know this is a woman who has had some you know difficult moments in her life and um, you know it was it was really heart wrenching, but also really insightful in all the different uh, elements of her of her life coming together and how it all just sort of leads up to this um, to this uh, mental breakdown. Um, so yeah, I uh, really liked this. I thought it was very impactful and um, very honest about a mental illness. And the last book I read was Nevada by Imogen Binney. That's a bit of fluff. Um, this I picked up in Gage the Word in London and um, uh, I hadn't really heard about the book but you know I, I liked the cover and I, I picked it up and it, it seemed interesting and when I um, uh, went to uh, to the checkout and uh, the person helping me was like oh my god I love that book you know it's so good and then <laughs> There was one other uh, employee um, at the other end of the book shop and he was like, what book's that? Uh, oh, Nevada. Oh yeah, I love that too. I love that too. So, you know, I had absolutely zero expectations when I started reading this book. Um, <laughs> but I think um, they were right. This is a, a great book. It is about um, a young trans woman and uh, she lives in New York and she works in a bookstore and she finds and she finds out her girlfriend is cheating on her um, but um, what makes her most sad is that she doesn't really care about it um, and then she started thinking like I, I don't really care about this job either you know after I've uh, transitioned um, I have only been in, in relationships. I've never been a woman uh, by myself. Um, so she decides to go uh, and leave New York and go on a, uh, a road trip um, without a specific destination in mind. 
So that's sort of the first half of the book and the second half of the book is uh, set a couple of uh, weeks later when she um, uh, meets uh, James who works at a, um, a Walmart in a very nondescript uh, boring little town. He's a person who's very much struggling with his gender identity and they you know, sort of recognize something in each other and um, you know they get talk and, talking and they connect to each other. This is definitely a book that is all about um, uh, the dialogue, you know, whether it is the inner dialogue that um, uh, Maria, the main character, is having with herself uh, in this book or that she's having with other, other people. The plot is actually very much secondary to the, to the book. It is all about being trans. The author is uh, uh, a trans woman as well and so that makes this book feel very genuine. Uh, I'm not uh, a trans myself. So I can't judge the book in that way, but it does feel genuine. It has a lot of um, thinking experiments um, about being trans. Um, you know, some examples are she talks about what it's like to have sex when you're trans. What is it like to have sex when you don't feel at ease in your own body and, and you ha actually have an aversion to your, you know, literal sex organs. How she feels like... Um, she has a responsibility to the people around her to make them feel comfortable. And she's like, oh, you know, I'm trans, but I will make this as easy as possible for you. And how that translated to her relationships. And she was always more concerned with making things run smoothly rather than, um, you know, actually being present in the relationship. She talks about what's the difference between dating as a guy and dating as a girl and, and doesn't really count as dating as a guy when I'm trans and does it count for me to date as a girl when the person I'm dating with knows I'm trans. Lots of these different conversations she's having um, and you know this is very much a flawed character you know she's not the poster child of being trans um, uh, but that reminds us that there's no one story of being trans. This is just a story of many. Uh, I really like the style of this book. It was very conversational. Her, her style was very sort of snarky and she's very quick-witted. It, it is a, an easy book to get into even if it has um, some very serious topics. Um, the only thing I didn't really enjoy was the amount of uh, drug use and sort of the casual way it was talked about. Yeah, that was something that um, annoyed me a little bit. Um, but all in all, um, I would highly recommend this book if you wanted to read um, something from the uh, trans perspective. So there we have it, the six books I read in August. Um, I uh, really enjoyed my reading overall. Um, I hope you had a great reading month as well. Uh, let me know what your favorite book was. I'd love to know. Uh, and also, um, you know, let me know if you read any of these books I mentioned today and what you thought of them. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye. <laughs>